Hello everybody, my name is Elliot Kimmel and this is a video tutorial on the circulatory system. It's really primarily intended for students in grade 10 uh, science, general science, studying the biology strand and looking at the systems of the body and of course the circulatory system. Uh, just before we get started, I'd like to say that the images in this video are not mine. Uh, they were just taken from the internet and um, used for educational purposes only. So thank you very much to the artists who created them. And just know that I'm not making any money from this. And if you're interested in some of my resources, please come by this website up here, www.zerobio.com. That's my website with all original graphics and stuff like that okay if you're a student um, if you are in my class however and you're watching this then the idea would be to take notes as you go along and do that and then there'll be a little assignment towards the end so we're going to talk about the circulatory system we have already had a look at the digestive system and uh, we've been looking at the respiratory system as well and we're moving on a little bit here all right so here we go with the circulatory system so take this down all right All right, so the first thing we're gonna talk about are some functions. Now there's some major and some um, minor functions of the circulatory system. And if you look at this diagram over here, you should recognize that uh, this is part of the digestive system. This is the intestine right here, and this is the little cavity where the food would be digested and the nutrients would be absorbed. And that's one of the major functions of the digestive, of the circulatory system, sorry is to um, absorb the nutrients into these blood vessels here. Now, typically when you see diagrams like this, red represents arteries, and they generally carry blood towards an organ. So these red things here would be carrying blood to the digestive system, and the veins are in blue, and they would carry blood out of the digestive system and uh, you know, to other parts of the body, back to the heart, essentially. So the nutrients are going to be absorbed into these blood vessels surrounding the intestine. And then the blood vessels are going to transport those nutrients throughout the body. So that's one of the functions that we want to look at is the fact that the circulatory system moves nutrients from the intestine to all body cells. Now, of course, um, the digestive system doesn't just absorb nutrients at the, the level of the small intestine. Uh, although that's the major uh, site of absorption, the large intestine absorbs water, and that could be considered a nutrient. So this could be the large intestine absorbing water into the bloodstream and then transporting it. Could have been the oral cavity. Well, there's really not all that much absorption going on there, but could have been the stomach. Okay, so that's one of the major functions. Another thing is, of course, that uh, the lungs are involved with picking up oxygen from the external, envir external environment and then transporting that oxygen through the bloodstream to all of the cells of the body that need oxygen. So in this diagram down here, you can see the lungs right here. And you can see the heart and you can see some of the major blood vessels. But if we really go into the lungs down to the microscopic level, you can see a bronchial so oxygen would be coming down here into a cluster of air sacs or alveoli right here. And surrounding this structure are all of the blood vessels. Okay, you can see some blue and red, very, very tiny blood vessels here. So oxygen moves from the alveolus into the bloodstream. And then the bloodstream, of course, transports that oxygen. Carbon dioxide, on the other hand, will move in the opposite direction. We'll talk about that in a moment. So another major function of the circulatory system is to transport oxygen. Now, by the way, um, you're copying notes if you're in my class, or if you happen to be a teacher using this video and you want your kids to be writing notes down, so you may have to pause the video periodically to let the students write down the notes and then move on. Okay, so I'm going to move on now. All right, now I've got an image down here of the kidneys. All right, this one shows the location of the kidneys. They're relatively high up in the body. There are two of them. All right, this shows the entire 
the structure of the kidney from the outside and this one cuts it in half so that you can see some of the internal structures. There are major blood vessels here, again red uh, indicating an artery and blue indicating a vein. This is the descending aorta and it's carrying blood from the heart down to the lower parts of the body and we'll talk about the heart later. And this is called the inferior vena cava. The heart would be up here. Okay, it's a funny looking heart. And it's carrying blood upwards. One of the major, fun well, the major function of the kidneys really is to filter blood. All right, it doesn't detoxify the blood. That's the job of the liver. But all of the blood, when the heart pumps, all of the blood will at some point travel down here and then through blood vessels, renal arteries, into the kidney and the kidney filters it. I mean, think of the kidney as some kind of a strainer with little holes in it, all right? And the blood will go through these little holes and only small materials will get through them. And large materials like blood cells or other big things will not be able to get through. But the stuff that does get through, some water and ions and various other materials, this is gonna create your urine, all right? So the kidney filters the blood, gets rid of excess water, ions, and of course there's certain wastes, okay? Not solid waste, that's the digestive, the digestive tract. But this waste material is gonna come out of the kidney down this whitish tube, and that's gonna be stored down here in the urinary bladder, and eventually you'll excrete that. So the role of the kidneys is to filter the blood. So the circulatory system carries wastes. But that, no, that waste could be excess water, like I said, excess whatever that can be removed in liquid. And it carries it from the various body tissues for disposal. And we're talking about kidneys and we're going to talk about lungs. All right, so moving a little bit quickly with the notes, so just go ahead and get that down. So the circulatory system carries wastes from the body tissues for disposal. Two major routes of exposing of wastes are carbon dioxide going to the lungs. That will then exhale the CO2, all right, but you need the bloodstream to carry it there. And of course, the blood will go to the kidneys for filtering, and that will show up in the urine, which you'll then excrete. So those are some more uh, major functions of the circulatory system. Now, some other functions are the following. Here you can see a human hand with all of the tissues removed and just the bloodstream in the, in the hand and in the, and in the forearm. And the reason that I have this picture here is, you know, in the wintertime, when it's cold out, how your fingers tend to get cold, your extremities will get cold, all right? And what's happening is blood is moving, of course, down here and going into your fingers to supply them with oxygen, nutrients, glucose, whatever, and then it carries those wastes away and the blood in general of course has to get back to back to the heart well when the blood gets to the extremities it tends to radiate out heat and that could be a good thing or that can be a bad thing if it's cold the blood comes down to the extremities your fingers your toes your ears your nose that kind of thing and heat just radiates off it. That's why if you put your hand close to somebody, you know, you can feel the heat coming off of them, the body heat. But if it's cold and you lose heat and then the blood goes back to your heart and the blood is cold, that can cause a problem with your heart or with your brain. It's, it's, it's a shock to the system. So in order to prevent too much cold blood going back to your heart, and your, your body core in the middle, your body says, well, look, it's cold out. I don't want my blood going all the way down here, losing heat and then coming back. And it sacrifices some of those extremities. It shuts off the pathways, the roadways 
for blood to get down there because it doesn't want to lose too much heat. And so if those pathways are closed, these extremities here can't get the nutrients that they need, all right, and they can't get rid of wastes and they could potentially be damaged or die. And this is, you know, in its uh, lesser damaging condition, this is like frostbite, all right, where the body essentially says, I have to sacrifice this extremity so that cold blood does not come back to, the, to my core, causing something like a heart attack, all right? It's a sad thing, but it's a way of maintaining life. You can lose the finger or lose the tip of the nose as, a, as long as you don't lose your life. But the other thing I wanted to say about this in general is that the, the bloodstream, the circulatory system, can regulate to some extent your, your temperature. If it is too hot, the blood will come down and you can radiate out heat. If it's too cold, you can control how much blood comes down here so that you don't lose too much heat. So in that way, the circulatory system is involved with regulating body temperature to some extent. All right, we are warm-blooded creatures as humans. We create our own body heat. We don't rely on the uh, environment like a cold-blooded um, organism does. We have to, to create our own heat. We have to conserve it. Sweating is another way to regulate body temperature. Um, shivering, the contraction and relaxation of muscles, which generates heat. You know, when you're cold and you shiver, it generates heat. So the body has to regulate its, its, its temperature, and the circulatory system is involved with that. Now, in the lower image down here, you can see the artist's view of a blood vessel and a bunch of blood cells. Most of these look like red blood cells here, but we'll talk about different types of blood cells traveling through. But this is not a wind tunnel, all right? They're not flying in air. There's liquid in here carrying the blood cells. And that liquid is also carrying all kinds of dissolved materials. Glucose from your food, ions, things like sodium, potassium, chloride, hormones, right? You've all heard that the hormone adrenaline, Adrenaline causes an increase in your heart rate, right? It's the fight or flight hormone, right? You've got a surge of adrenaline. You've got this energy and this excitement. Watching this video, the adrenaline is being released, right? Adrenaline is called a hormone to differentiate it from an enzyme because we talked about some enzymes in the digestive system. And hormones are probably a bit of a mystery to you right now, but just imagine there's some complicated chemical that travels through the bloodstream and does a job like adrenaline increasing your heart rate. Well, adrenaline has to travel through the blood. It's carried in the blood. It's a, it's a, a molecule, like there it is, all right? Some just big squiggly molecule, and it's traveling through the blood like the bloodstream. Think of this as the ocean, and these are fish swimming in it, all right? So the, the point that I'm trying to make is that the blood carries various substances, it's going to carry white blood cells, for example. This is WBC, white blood cells, to areas of the body where there are viruses or bacteria. All right, if you think of white blood cells as like the police, all right, the army, they have to go fight the invaders. They have to travel through the bloodstream. So, transports white blood cells. It also transports hormones. Of course, that requires the heart to beat, to push the blood, which carries all of these things. So there are many things that we could say here. I'm just choosing a couple, all right? Transports white blood cells, and of course, all the other blood cells. Transports hormones, ions, glucose, water, you name it. Okay, I'm going to move on again. Pause the video if you need to catch up writing this stuff down, okay? Now, those were some of the major functions of the circulatory system. Now, I sort of started to talk about blood and blood vessels a little bit. Now, let's look at the actual parts of the circulatory system. Now, this is an amazing uh, image. You may have seen this or something like this before. Here we have a human being, and you can see a little bit of the skeleton in there, the arm, a bit of the breastbone. 
and you can see a lot of the circulatory system. Here's the heart, all right? The heart's right in there. And all of these blood vessels, here's the liver, by the way. All right, there's the liver. And the lung would be here and another lung. And, and basically just looking at how the body is um, fed by all these road, roadways, which are, the blood, which are the blood vessels. All right, so let's look at the parts of the circulatory system. We've got blood, which we'll have a look at in a minute. We've got the heart. Various types of vessels. Oops, sorry, that was a little bit quick. Those are the three main things. Blood, a little bit to say about that. The heart and vessels. And those are the three major parts of, of, uh, of a typical um, circulatory system. Now, if you start looking at different organisms like the earthworm, which is something that grade 10 students do, or the frog, or the fetal pig, there are going to be differences, okay? But if you're looking at a mammal like a human, you're gonna get a, a lot of similarities. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about blood. All right, this image shows an overview of all of the blood cells, the different types of blood cells. We've got some red blood cells here. We've got some white blood cells. We've got some platelets. These star-shaped things here. All right, these are the platelets. All right, and then we've got this straw-colored liquid, this yellow stuff, which is plasma, the liquid that when someone talks about blood, they often think of liquid, right? No, blood is, blood is a liquid. Well, blood is only partially a liquid, maybe a bit more than 50% liquid, and then cells. So let's talk about all these different components in blood. So first of all, blood is a connective tissue. It's in the connective and supporting category of major tissues. Blood then is a specific type of connective tissue, just as bone is or, or cartilage, all right? Blood is a connective tissue, but the difference here between bone and cartilage and those kind of things is that blood travels around the body due to the heart, and it stays in the, in, in the blood vessels. Blood is composed of the following things. Red blood cells, the abbreviation, the abbreviation being RBCs for red blood cells. White blood cells or WBCs. Platelets, so those are all of the blood cells we mentioned here. And then plasma, that, that, the liquid. So think of blood as, think of the plasma as the ocean. And all of these are the types of ships, boats that travel on the ocean. How about submarines, maybe in the ocean, right? That'd be cool. Or fish, or people on surfboards. All right. Okay, let's talk about red blood cells, first of all. So here we have an image um, of red blood cells. This is a real picture. And as you can see, they look like a little uh, donut. All right, but they still have a little bit in there. Donut has a little hole there, right? So they're just, they dip in like that. So red blood cells have a shape like this from the side and they dip in and then they come out and they dip in there and then they come out. <laughs> Horrible at drawing. All right, this little indentation is on that side and on that side. So it's concave there, it's concave there. So they're called biconcave. They are biconcave discs. All right. You're going to see this kind of stuff when we do lenses and mirrors and stuff like that too in the optic strand. So that's what a red blood cell looks like. All right. And when you look at this under the microscope, if you've got your slide there and the light is coming through that way and coming up into your eye, it's going to look very light here and darker here. And maybe you've seen some blood under the microscope. And you notice red blood cells, they sort of look like they have a white area in here. That's because there's more light coming through. Okay, so let's write about red blood cells. Red blood cells are the most abundant 
I don't know why that bracket is there, snuck in there somehow. And our biconcave in shape, as we just said. They're the most abundant. So when you look at a microscope slide, or when you look at blood, it looks red. Your blood doesn't really look white, does it? Might look a little bit bluish, but we can talk about that in a minute. All right. Most abundant and biconcave in shape. Red blood cells carry oxygen, O2, chemical formula. Learn your chemical formulas. They carry oxygen on a protein, which is called hemoglobin. You probably heard about that before, but maybe you wondered what it was. And that makes them appear red. So we'll have a look at the diagram while you write that down. Oh, what's a good color? Let's try this. Here is a red blood cell. And it looks red, doesn't it? And here's the real picture that does look red. Inside the red blood cell are all kinds of molecules of hemoglobin. There's not just one. There's a whole bunch of them. And this is what hemoglobin could essentially look like. It's made of four worm-like things. That orange one, this green one, this pink one, and this purple one. I'm going to get rid of that stuff there so we can see it. All right. These worm-like structures, this is all part of one hemoglobin molecule. And like I said, there's tons of them, thousands of them, maybe more. And each hemoglobin molecule can carry oxygen. Now, you see this part here. Let me, let me actually get rid of that and go to a different color. There's a little flying saucer-like structure there, and there's one there, and there's one there, and there's one right there. These things carry oxygen. So an oxygen molecule clicks on there, and on there, and on there, and on there. This is like a taxi. Think of hemoglobin like a taxi for oxygen. And these are the people. And how many people can you fit in the taxi? Four, right? Maximum capacity, four. I think. All right. So oxygen clicks onto the hemoglobin molecule and there's a lot of them in there. So there's a lot of oxygen. This is a little ship carrying taxis. The, the analogy is breaking down. All right. So hemoglobin carries oxygen. And when the red blood cell goes from, you know, say your lungs where you pick up oxygen and the red blood cell travels to somewhere else in the body, let's say your brain. Am I drawing over my face here? <laughs> The hemoglobin is going to release the oxygen to the brain. So that's how it works. And this is why your blood looks red. Because oxygen on hemoglobin gives it a reddish color. And you have so many red blood cells. Let's carry on. We're going to talk about white blood cells. Now, if you've looked under the microscope, you'll probably see something like this. And there's the white spot I was talking about, right? In all of these, these are all red blood cells, lots and lots of them. And out here, we can see two white blood cells. But they don't look white, whitish a bit. They look kind of purple. And that's because of the stain that is used to see them. All right, red blood cells are red. So there's a color to them, so you can see them. White blood cells might be a little bit harder to see. Although they're a bit bigger, there's not that many of them. So when the person that made the slide stains it, they start to get, to get a purplish color. And the dark purple that you're seeing right here and these lobe-like things, that's the nucleus or parts of the nucleus. So white blood cells have a nucleus. The red blood cell has lost its nucleus. You just get a clear area there. It's very thin there. There are many types of white blood cells and it gets very complicated, all right? These things are made generally in the bone marrow as are your red blood cells. And there's many types. So let's talk a little bit more about white blood cells, okay? Their major role is to fight infection. When foreign agents get into the body, they go off like police and they attack. Okay, they fight the foreign infection. They fire antibodies at them. They engulf them. They eat them. There's various ways that they are part of the immune system to fight infection. That's what they do. However, they make up less than 1% of the blood, although there are many different kinds, as you can see here. All right. So if you think about a typical city and you're driving around, 
Think about how many police cars you see. You don't see that many, right? It's sort of like white blood cells, all right? But if there's a problem, if there's an accident or if there's a crime or something, all the police descend on it, you start to see a lot. So think of white blood cells coming to the scene of a crime, okay? They are the only blood cells with a nucleus, all right? And the nucleus is very strange in a white blood cell, so don't worry about that, but they have a nucleus. Red blood cells lose their nucleus at maturity so that they can carry more oxygen. And the next one we're going to talk about, the platelets, uh, they're just fragments of cells anyhow. Okay. Let's go on. We are going to talk about platelets right now. And here they are. Lots of red blood cells. This guy here, strange looking animal. Now look at this, looks like an ant colony, right? There's tons of them, one there and there and there and there and there and there. And this is the red blood cell. And what's happening here is these are sticky. These platelets are sticky. And when there's a problem, they come along and let's say you get cut or something like that. They come along and they start releasing a chemical that's like a glue, like a slime. And all of these fibers are sticky fibers and it causes them all to congeal together to create a clot. So platelets are involved with blood clotting. Platelets help with blood clotting to prevent bleeding. So if you get cut, the reason you stop bleeding and get a scab is because of platelets. Now there are other cells that may come to the area. The white blood cells go, hey man, there's an opening here. Some bacteria are going to get in. Let's go there. And all the police cars come and they crash into the hole there and they sort of plug it up. The platelets come and they glue all those cars together and they glue the hole as well. So everything could be involved there. All right. They are the smallest of the blood cells and they're actually fragments of cells. So, I mean, look at, you know, this is a red blood cell here. Compare the size of the red blood cell to a size of one platelet or another platelet there. And this is the big red blood cell right here. So they're quite small. They're very hard to see under the microscope, although you can see them. There are various disorders of the blood. One that you may have heard about is called hemophilia. This is where the platelets have a problem and they are failing to clot the blood. All right, and that's all we're going to say about it. Um, but that's a bleeding disorder. All right, we'll study that a bit more in grade 11 biology in the genetics section. Okay, so that's red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Oops. We still need to talk about the liquid portion of the blood, and that is plasma. And as you can see in this illustration here in a test tube, there are a lot of red blood cells, so maybe 45%. You don't have to draw these images. You're welcome to take extra notes if you like. Not very much white blood cells and platelets, as you can see, less than 1%. But a good amount of the blood is this yellowish liquid, which is called plasma. All right. Now, and if you leave blood in a test tube like this, if blood is taken from a patient and put in a test tube, over time, the red blood cells will sink to the bottom, the white blood cells will be here, and the liquid, which is the least dense, is going to be on the surface. All right, so that's plasma. And this illustration just shows uh, looking into a blood vessel, seeing there are many types of blood cells. Again, we've got the red blood cells, the platelets, look how small they are, just little fragments, and the various types of white blood cells, but all within this liquid here, which would be the plasma. So let's write about the plasma. Plasma is the liquid that carries blood cells and makes up over half, as you can see, over half of blood's volume. So the next time you think about blood, think about the fact that it's not just liquid and it's not just red blood cells, it's not just red, there's lots of stuff going on. Red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and plasma. And of course, within that plasma is the glucose that you absorbed in the small intestine. There's the water, there's the ions, the hormones, and the fact that this stuff flowing through the body helps to regulate your body temperature and carry various wastes, carbon dioxide, etc.
Okay, now what I want you to do, and this probably applies more to uh, my classes than anybody else that might be watching this video, it's time for you to make some of your own notes. One of the best ways to learn. Instead of me telling you everything, you're going to read about it. This is from the Nelson uh, textbook. Actually, yeah, the Nelson Science Perspectives textbook. Sorry, I had to look over at the book for a second. Page 84 to 86. And what I'm asking you to do, it looks like a lot of stuff, but it's not that bad once you get into it. All right, it should take you 20 minutes, 30 minutes, something like that. You make your own notes on blood vessels. I mean, it's about a paragraph or two paragraphs in the book. Make some nice notes on arteries and veins and capillaries. And we'll talk about that. And I'll tell you more about each of these when I, when I see you. Coronary artery disease and heart attack. Now, we haven't talked about the heart, but you will learn all the chambers of the heart and where there's oxygen and blood, deoxygenated blood and all that kind of stuff. So we will get into that. But for now, I'd like you to look at something called coronary artery disease. And this is where the arteries that bring blood through the heart itself. I mean, the heart doesn't just pump blood to everywhere else. It's like, I need some blood myself. I need some nutrients. So when the blood vessels that provide the heart with blood get blocked, like too much traffic, all right, or the road is broken or something, this can cause disease. This is coronary artery disease, the, the disease of the arteries that serve the heart, the coronary arteries. Now, you don't have to write a lot about these, but what is coronary artery disease? Well, I sort of just told you, but see what the book says. What can cause it? What are some of the symptoms that a person is going to feel when they have it or experience? And how do you diagnose it? All right, we need to talk about medical technology. And then heart attack. This is different. This coronary artery disease can lead to a heart attack. So what is a heart attack? You've all heard about them. What is it? What causes a heart attack? Is there anything else other than this? What are some of the symptoms that a person goes through when they are having a heart attack? And how do you diagnose it? Now, I will have more to say about all of these things. I want you to get something in your notes. Then when I see you, we'll talk about all this stuff and we'll delve deeper into it. All right. Hope you enjoyed that video tutorial. Hope you learned something. Take care. See you again soon.